Thomas. Jaydeep, the floor is yours. I can see the participants are joining. So as uh, if you see the number of participants going up, so I'm just waiting half a minute for that. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the online workshop on renewable energy in Tamil Nadu. We are very grateful that colleagues from Tamil Nadu have joined us today, despite the deep depression that is affecting the southern parts of the coast, Kannakumari district, Thudukuri district, Pamban, that whole area. We understand that there are colleagues, journalist colleagues, who had registered and at every intention of joining this, but at the, at the last moment have been forced to run out for immediate coverage instead of, of the situation that has been causing by the heavy rainfall, which is still going on. So what we are going to do is that we shall share the presentations, not only uh, with the participants and but also with everybody who has registered the session is already being recorded and the recording will be available to everybody all the participants and all those who have registered and all presentations will also be shared so that you don't worry about that and you don't have to take notes uh, so all all presentations will be shared but yes if any speaker is speaking without presentations it may make sense to take notes right uh, without further ado i want to go ahead with this we are going to start with a situation a background understanding of the current re situation in tamil nadu and that will be shared with you by my colleague, Sapna Gopal. Sapna, over to you. Hi, good morning, everybody. And I'm just uh, sharing a few slides, which uh, will just uh, give us uh, an idea of, uh, so one second, I'll just share the screen. Yeah. So is it uh, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Yeah. So this is the uh, we're talking about uh, the renewable energy scenario in uh, Tamil Nadu and just looking at some facts and figures. So this is the uh, installed RE installed capacity in Tamil Nadu as on uh, 30th September 2020. The figures have been provided to uh, us uh, by Tamil Nadu Energy Development Association, TEDA. And uh, these are the figures. So I, I wind, uh, I think uh, wind kind of dominates uh, Tamil Nadu. So the capacity is in megawatts. So it's 9,347 megawatt and solar PV is 4,221 megawatt. And then there's Pegasse and biomass. So the total is um, 14,545 megawatts. And uh, these are the renewable energy resources rich states. So um, actually uh, after Karnataka, I think Tamil Nadu has got very good figures of uh, uh, as uh, these graphs uh, show over here. So, and then this is the installed, uh, total uh, installed capacity again uh, in uh, megawatts and uh, renewable energy sources have uh, 
very uh, impressive figure of uh, 43%. So they're contributing a lot. There's also uh, hydropower, interestingly, uh, just like Maharashtra, even in Tamil Nadu, there is a hydropower, which is uh, contributing around uh, 7%. So the total installed capacity, as the uh, graph shows over here, is uh, 31,931 megawatt. So uh, I guess that's a good figure. And this is the uh, wind uh, capacity and uh, it's uh, in million units. So uh, this, uh, we have got figures uh, have been provided till February uh, 2018. So, so the economic viability of renewable energy, uh, interestingly, 10 years ago, a decade ago, renewable energy, especially solar was costlier. Now it's supposed to have become cheaper than con conventional power. And uh, since the there's a lot of instability attached in terms of wind and solar power depending on the seasons especially wind so they play a vital role they could compete therefore with conventional power though though they have become cheaper and in order to overcome this particular issue there's a lot of efforts are being made uh, towards forecasting and scheduling of uh, renewable energy uh, power so then there is uh, distributed power generation uh, which is uh, now slowly Uh, you know, kind of gaining ground in order to distribute power generation more so through solar uh, is being considered. And there was this project which is very well known. It's called Kusum, and uh, it had was initiated by Tandet Co and Teda, and it was to be aided by both the central and the state government and entailed solarization of 20,000 pump sets and uh, installing solar panel, power panels at the respective locations, thereby reducing uh, transmission and distribution losses. And then there is also this concept of electric vehicles, which is increasingly gaining ground. So uh, instead of charging EVs through the conventional power, which entails a lot of charging stations and all that, uh, what is now making more sense, and even in, in the southern state of Kerala, what is increasingly being done is a lot of solar power is being used to uh, uh, kind of charge uh, vehicles. A lot of vehicles have these solar panels fitted on top, and then, you know, th those keep getting charged. So you don't have the uh, thing of, you know, how do I charge my vehicle? What do I do? Where is the next charging station? So. Uh, so then it also kind of uh, re reduces the dependence on the grid for charging uh, the vehicle and you know giving that particular infrastructure so this is another aspect uh, which uh, is now being considered so this uh, in uh, you know this thing is in brief is uh, i mean just touched very very briefly on the figures facts and what is uh, in the offing in the state of tamil nadu uh, so now over to the experts and uh, the other presentations and speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sapna. So uh, here's a message to all colleagues. All these uh, slides with all this information will be available to you, as will the recording. And whatever questions you have for any of us, any of the speakers, please put them in the Q&A box. And uh, once you put them in the Q&A box, then the, the speakers and panelists can see it. We are going to move to the first speaker of the day, who is Bharat Jairaj of World Resources Institute, India. I know that like many of us, Bharat is having uh, connectivity issues due to the cyclone, the aftermath of the cyclone. So... He will speak and I'll run his slides. Bharat, over to you. Right. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Joydeep. Uh, and uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for hosting this particular um, conversation. I think it's, it's very important that uh, um, as a society, we are uh, more involved in uh, decisions around power sector. Um, it's not uh, the easiest sector to follow or track. Um, but it is a, such an important sector because it enables so much of, the, uh, so much of what we consider development and growth um, that um, uh, we just, uh, you know, it's very, very important that it, it, the sort of energy sector literacy improves. And I'm really glad this session is being organized. Um, could you, uh, Joydeep, uh, start the slideshow? Thanks. Um, 
I'm sorry, uh, um, you know, the connection may not be that great. Uh, we are still uh, waiting for uh, internet services to be resumed, but uh, I hope uh, I'm, I'm audible. Uh, if not, I hope the slides at least will provide uh, some uh, sense of what I'm trying to convey. You're perfectly uh, audible, then, Bharat, not a problem. I'll just uh, move this to sli a slideshow mode. Yes, please. Yeah. And uh, you can move to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so what I thought I'd do uh, sort of to build on the, uh, the earlier uh, uh, sort of background provided um, was uh, to, uh, to, to talk a bit about the journey that Tamil Nadu has made. And this is an important, uh, important uh, journey to understand. Um, you can see on this particular slide where we have uh, put together uh, the, the, the demand and, and supply sort of gap, uh, with the blue being uh, the peak demand any given year, and then, uh, uh, and then the orange being the, the, the peak met during that year. And you can see uh, starting from 2012, significant gap between demand and supply. Um, and that gap, as we go from 2012 to 2020, you can see that the gap has, has significantly uh, reduced. Uh, so uh, from uh, almost 2,750 megawatts in 2012, the, the gap, uh, it is now less than 100 megawatts, um, which is uh, really, it's not about arithmetic and getting it absolutely right. Uh, it is extremely difficult to get this exactly right. but. Uh, the important uh, point here is that the uh, gap has, has reduced, which is extremely important. Uh, also, uh, two more things you can see, that the demand has continued to grow. Uh, the blue, uh, you, you can see the blue columns have continued to grow over this, uh, eight, uh, these eight, nine years. Again, this is a, a sign of a sort of reasonably healthy economy that's growing. Uh, and you can see the supply uh, sort of uh, picking up uh, as you go into 2014, 15, 16. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Bharat, yeah. Bharat, your audio dropped for the last half a minute. Uh, Can you just repeat your last couple of sentences, please? Yeah, I just said uh, that the, uh, the, the sort of Three things to take away from this. One, of course, is the demand supply gap has reduced. The second is that uh, demand has continued to increase uh, and, and that the supply has also sort of increased to meet this demand and that this is a good sign. It's a healthy sign of a growing economy. The next slide. So on this slide, uh, it's, uh, this is sort of focused on uh, wind and uh, solar alone. And you can see that the significant uh, growth in wind, uh, you know, for a few decades now. And uh, the sort of critical point I want to make here is that um, uh, if you think back of the previous slide, where I, I talked about how the supply was uh, increasing to meet the demand, a significant part of that growth in supply has been through wind and solar. Um, and you can see the growth in solar, it gets a little more aggressive in the last uh, few years. Uh, that's the yellow uh, uh, column that you can see on this graph, the one on the left. Um, and wind continues to account for a significant uh, part uh, of the Tamil Nadu's uh, supply. Uh, so uh, if you look at the, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, this is just installed capacity. So uh, it was 6,900 megawatts in uh, 2012, and um, it's gone up to uh, almost, I mean, a little over 9,400 actually um, as of October uh, of this year. Um, now on the right, uh, the, the graph on the right, uh, talks about the potential, and the potential you can see is is exponential. Uh, please look at the look at the uh, legend. You'll see the difference uh, in the uh, in the sort of uh, uh, extent, the potential of the sector. The wind sector is vastly underexplored, underutilized, and even in solar, 
um, the uh, potential is significantly more. Uh, you have uh, in, uh, again, in that same graph on the right, you see uh, target. Uh, there is a policy, the Tamil Nadu Solar Policy 2019, that uh, sets a target of, um, of 9,000 megawatts uh, to be achieved in uh, five years. Uh, there is no specific uh, wind policy or wind target apart from the RPO uh, or the renewable purchase obligation. Uh, and Tamil Nadu is uh, currently very, very close to achieving its uh, wind RPO. Uh, and this uh, year, as we know, there were a few tenders issue, uh, I mean, uh, tenders uh, that uh, were approved um, by uh, the TNERC to make up that gap, which is uh, to achieve the uh, wind RPO. But this is this slide is if you if you're thinking about one thing to take away from this slide, it is that wind and solar contribute significantly to the state, and it is still we are we are in some cases just scratching the surface in terms of the potential of these two uh, sources of uh, energy. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, just in terms of pipeline, there are. Uh, uh, you know, the, the like other sectors, um, you know, it, none of uh, no no energy transition, uh, no transition of any kind will be linear. There will be one step forward, two steps back. There will be you know a few steps to the side, and so on. And uh, these sectors are no different. So you see here that um, in solar there was the 500 megawatt uh, um, Kadaladi uh, project, uh, which was uh, recently. Um, Cancelled because of the uh, uh, issues faced in, in acquiring land and has been sort of relocated, if I can call it that, um, in nearby uh, Kamuti. Uh, and uh, of course, this is still early stage, but it is likely that uh, an additional 500 megawatts uh, will be uh, will come up uh, in uh, Kamuti. Similarly, on wind, um, as I mentioned uh, this year. Uh, TNERC approved uh, 440 megawatts of uh, new wind. Um, and then there is also a very interesting uh, Nive MNRE uh, uh, sort of study, uh, which has identified one gigawatt offshore wind uh, potential, uh, sorry, project uh, uh, in uh, sort of near Danushkodi. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is sort of where, where the projects are in the pipeline. There are, of course, some smaller projects, but these um, are, the, are the bigger ones. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, this uh, is a very interesting uh, slide. Again, it, it helps you understand the transition and, and the journey that Tamar Nadu has made. Uh, you can see on the left, this is uh, install capacity. Uh, and here, the, uh, the share by source. Uh, the one on the left is in 2012, and the one on the right is in 2020. Uh, you know, the numbers may be a little, uh, you know, we may be missing a few uh, hundred uh, megawatts here and there. Uh, and that's because, you know, the, 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 there is a, uh, always a challenge with getting the exact number on any given date. But uh, the idea is, is to provide a, an overview. So on the left, in 2012, we had uh, roughly 18,000, I mean, we had just a shade under 19,000 megawatts of installed capacity. There has been almost a, a, a sort of 10,000 10, megawatt uh, of new installed capacity in these last eight, nine years. Um, and uh, uh, you can see here on the left, if you look from the left uh, and then compare it with the right, some things stand out. The share of coal has gone up. Uh, uh, mainly, uh, of course, because of the central uh, generating stations being added to uh, the uh, Tamil Nadu's fleet. Um, uh, you can also see that nuclear, again, uh, mainly because the sort of central, because that central is sort of adding, but nuclear has gone up. Um, uh, and you also see solar, sort of a new entrant, uh, taking on a, a, a small but significant chunk. And then you can see in in overall terms, wind has reduced. Now, this is uh, not to be. This is merely installed capacity, so don't read uh, anything more into it. This is just the uh, uh, capacity share by source, right? Um, but it's an important point. You can see how uh, many of the um, other um, thermal and fossil fuel based sort of all marked in gray. How the their that share uh, has sort of reduced overall. 
uh, and it's a it's a good uh, way to understand the, the the transition, how things, uh, how, where investments are taking place, and uh, what sources uh, of fuel are being uh, encouraged. The next slide, please. So, if that was in terms of installed capacity, this slide is in terms of the actual generation. Um, the uh, generation. So, this is generation share by source. Um, now, this is you know the actual electrons that are flowing uh, through the wires and cables. Where are they coming from, right? Now, here is where you understand the impact of that uh, transition. You can see for the straightaway, the first thing that stands out, of course, is the reliance on coal as the primary source of fuel has not, um, has not gone away, but has re reduced significantly, right? It is reduced significantly. Um, it's now at a 40, at 46 uh, percent. Here also you'll see uh, the point I was making about wind. Uh, wind continues to be a steady partner uh, in Tamil Nadu, and even though the actual uh, the investments in no, I mean the investments in in wind haven't been exponential, unlike uh, uh, in in solar, you still see that the contribution of wind continues to be stable uh, over this period. You see nuclear has significantly increased uh, the reliance, I mean, the, the uh, energy coming from nuclear and solar, of course, new entrant, but already playing a, an, an, a non-trivial role in the state. You can see the non-coal and lignite uh, uh, thermal contribution also significantly reduced. Now, this is a, a, a very, uh, this is a sort of, if you know, the previous slide was about installed capacity. This one is about generation share. So you can see the stories that's coming out is pretty clear. It is about uh, a state that is increasingly looking to uh, non-fossil fuel uh, sources to meet its uh, its its and he needs as as the as this sector is growing uh, have you uh, uh, i'm not yeah. sure if the slide yeah, is yeah now uh, now now you're back now you're back yeah okay yeah now no going on okay. and on now uh, you're fine yeah now you're fine okay Okay. Do All right. Can you go to, the, go next to the next slide? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, this uh, slide uh, is merely uh, to, to this slide is merely to uh, merely to talk about uh, just the change in ownership, right? Just the uh, change in ownership that has happened uh, in the sector. It's not uh, that uh, critical. Uh, a slide, except uh, for you to note that uh, the state, Tamil Nadu's ownership over power being generated in the state uh, has reduced. Uh, and what, is, uh, what has uh, replaced that really is the share of the central government owned power plants and the uh, private power plants. Um, and uh, equally important to note that much of the private uh, investment that has taken place uh, is in wind and solar, where the state has virtually no sizable um, uh, wind or solar plants. So that's the sort of main point of, of this slide. Um, now, let me then move uh, to the next slide. All right, I'm sorry, this is a bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, wordy. But uh, bear with me, you don't, uh, you'll have the slides so you can read them uh, at leisure. I'll just make a, a sort of few points. So uh, as I mentioned, so this was, what are the challenges that the solar uh, sector face, right? So what is this? So I've sort of given you the overview in terms of numbers, the journey, the direction that the state has moved. So what, uh, what sort of ails the solar sector? Uh, one important point to keep in mind is uh, the Tamil Nadu solar policy released last year, uh, uh, an ambitious 9,000 megawatts in five years kind of target. Um, but uh, things have been uh, moving slow, particularly 
on the uh, consumer side. The, the 9,000 megawatt target was split uh, into 60% uh, utility scale. That's 5,400 megawatts of uh, utility scale projects and uh, 3,600 megawatts of uh, consumer side. Um, and particularly in the consumer side, things have been moving quite slowly. And, and of course, a big part of that is, uh, is the challenges in terms of institutional capacity. Um, and I was hoping that uh, Mr. Murli uh, would have been, would, would be here today to, to talk a bit about TEDA's uh, own efforts and, and, and also the efforts made by uh, Tangetco and so on. Uh, but there are challenges uh, in terms of the institution, uh, uh, in terms of pushing, and of course, uh, 2020 hasn't been kind uh, to any of us uh, and uh, trying to push through um, you know, ambitious targets at, at, and, and achieving that. Uh, 2020 is, has been particularly tough. Um, and I want to draw out in particular rooftop solar uh, as facing significant challenges. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, there is extremely low awareness uh, amongst uh, uh, residents uh, in the state, uh, not just uh, who to go to uh, if you wanted to install rooftop solar, but how do you go about it? Uh, the, the the sort of limited finance availability uh, and also uh, importantly the low feed-in tariff uh, for sale of excess power. So the rooftop solar sector has been particularly um, uh, uh, challenged, if I can say that. Uh, on the utility side or utility scale side, uh, we've seen also some issues. Um, there are uh, some high cost uh, solar PPAs uh, and that doesn't help us because um, when there is cheaper fuel, uh, it is absolutely uh, incumbent on the, um, on the utility to find um, ways uh, to, uh, you know, uh, optimize the power that they are buying. Um, so in, uh, consequently, the must run status uh, given to renewables uh, isn't necessarily adhered to. Um, we also have a, a, a larger challenge uh, with solar being, um, uh, you know, for, for solar to truly play a larger role, uh, the commercial viability of storage is, is going to be critical. Uh, there are challenges there. And then overall, we know that uh, Tangent Co um, uh, is, is uh, significantly debt ridden um, and that no Band-Aid type solutions are going to help. Um, so all of this put together, uh, some of these are solar specific. Some of these are uh, uh, sort of uh, agnostic to, the, uh, to solar. Uh, but uh, they continue to uh, be, uh, you know, quite challenging uh, for the growth of the sector. Um, let me move then to the next slide, where I'll talk about the challenges that wind is facing. Uh, for wind, I think, you know, as I said, wind has been a reliable partner uh, in in Tamil Nadu. But you know, you saw the potential of wind to play a much more and much bigger role. And I suspect Mr. Giri will talk about uh, a lot of that uh, in, in, in his uh, presentation. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the important, so a couple of things to keep in mind, uh, we have over 9,000 uh, megawatts of wind capacity, but the evacuation capacity hasn't uh, kept up with it. Uh, and I think we have somewhere around 5,000 megawatt, megawatts of that can be evacuated. There are efforts to strengthen, uh, but like I said, they haven't kept pace with the growth of the wind sector. Um, the other big concern, of course, is the non-payment of dues um, uh, to the wind power plants. Uh, that you know has is sort of uh, it's a vicious cycle uh, because the non-payment of dues to the generators, uh, next, you know, uh, creates sort of concerns about what happens next year, what happens next year, and so on. Um, and, and we've seen also, just if you went to the Prapti uh, uh, dashboard, you would see that Tangetco's sort of dues to the, gen, to the generation companies. Now, of course, this is not just solar and wind, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all the sort of generation company sort of dues uh, has gone up from roughly 5,000 crores in 2018 to over 20,000 crores in 2020. Um, so, uh, there is, um, a, a, you know, this non-payment of dues uh, is a significant uh, problem uh, in the sector. And 
you can see it reflected in the sort of uh, fairly uh, lukewarm response from the wind sector to the new tenders. Uh, the 2017 tenders, um, you know, many of them still sort of languishing. Um, the 2020 sector, again, very, very lukewarm response. Uh, the older plants uh, need to be repowered. Everyone agrees there are tons of reports on it. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the question is, uh, if these aren't, if, if the payments are not going to be made, uh, investing in this sector becomes a tough decision for people to make. So uh, this needs some kind of a push, uh, uh, and I'm sure you know we can get to it uh, in the questions. And um, the next slide, please. And I'll try and sort of wrap up since we have other speakers as well. Um, so sort of in terms of uh, the positives, I think there are tons of, uh, of opportunities really. Uh, the solar, and I'll just pick uh, two of them. One is I think uh, the point made about Kusum. Uh, Kusum is uh, uh, sort of roughly the solarizing of agriculture, um, and it promises uh, to be significantly, uh, you know, one of those rare uh, policy measures that could be uh, a win for agricultural sector in that they get reliable power in the daytime, um, and then, you know, they will know when they get their power, and uh, uh, any excess power that they uh, are not consuming, they can sell to Tangetco. For Tangetco, it's also a win because it 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 uh, you know removes the uh, need to supply electricity to a sector which has been non-revenue for for such a long period of time, and is also an, a win for the state government because uh, the subsidy uh, burden on the state, uh, since it has to cover the the gap uh, of the costs incurred by Tangetco uh, to for supply. Uh, will will also uh, be significantly reduced. So the Kusum implementation on priority is a huge, huge growth opportunity. Uh, the the pilot, I mean, the initial one was uh, to be uh, launched uh, earlier this year. It's still likely to happen in the next few months. The first 20,000 farms uh, under the Kusum C scheme, uh, but you know, much more can be done on Kusum. The other significant opportunity is to look at rooftop solar in public buildings. The government of Tamil Nadu owns so many buildings and uh, you know, as a single owner with so many buildings, it is, it's, it's absolutely doable to, 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 to take on a target of let's say 50% or 70% of those buildings uh, to become rooftop, uh, to, to become, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to install rooftop solar. Uh, so I think significant growth opportunities there. On wind, I won't say much because we have uh, Mr. Giri, uh, but I'd say that the offshore wind capacity could be leveraged. Uh, Nive has done some um, excellent uh, work and uh, you know, Tamil Nadu is uh, India's sort of number one state for offshore wind capacity. Of course, uh, it, uh, we must take care of the environmental and social issues that will uh, come up with offshore wind. Those need to be addressed. Um, and, and finally, on the issue of uh, uh, planning and operations, uh, uh, there is a huge opportunity in actually uh, getting better at improving the flexibility uh, of thermal power, you know, the ramping up and ramping down so that what we shift towards in this transition is solar and wind and uh, other renewable sources being our primary, uh, primary fuel uh, and then using uh, the fossil fuels as backup uh, just to meet the gap in, in, in supply. So there's a significant opportunity there and there are companies in India, NTPC included, that have done a fair bit of work uh, in terms of uh, improving uh, the flexibility, flexibilization of, uh, of, of coal. Um, and then uh, to my um, sort of final slide. And um, I can't see it yet. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, all right. So. Um, yeah, so look, the, the story in Tamil Nadu is actually an extremely good story, right? Uh, Tamil Nadu has been getting better uh, at, um, we saw how the demand supply gap has reduced. Uh, we saw how renewable energy has, has been growing steadily and, and played, plays a key role in implementing, in, in meeting that gap. Um, we've seen how, as on date, Tamil Nadu's installed capacity of renewables is 43 uh, or so percentage and in terms of energy, uh, it's close to 
you know, roughly about 20 or 20, 22 percent. So this is a very good story. Uh, from 2012 to 2020, Tamil Nadu has done excellent um, uh, in terms of the energy transition. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but more can be done and more needs to be done. And I think the these are sort of four points I want to sort of end with. One is, you know, we have to now start getting better at integrated energy planning. And that means we have to be able to, um, to look at not just uh, meeting, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this demand with whatever supply, but we want to ensure that we're making investments at the right time so that we don't have over, uh, we are not over investing or under investing, that we're actually getting better at utilizing the resources in a more efficient manner. The second is we have to rationalize our tariffs uh, because the big problem in the state uh, is uh, that uh, you know we haven't we we don't have uh, we don't uh, pay for electricity in the way that uh, we ought to, and by that what I mean is um, you know the last time I think the tariffs were changed uh, revised in the state was somewhere 2014 or or some somewhere around that, um, and then after that Tangetco uh, hasn't filed or I could, I could even say hasn't been able to file um, ARRs. Now, as per the Electricity Act, uh, this is supposed to happen every year. Uh, November, it's supposed to be filed and you know the act says it, all this very clearly, but um, Tamil Nadu has found it very difficult to, uh, to take steps towards rationalizing its tariffs. Now, if we don't do that, uh, it, it continues to be a huge challenge because it has a ripple effect, as we said, across the sector. Um, now we have, uh, you know, and it, this doesn't mean we have to charge people, um, uh, you know, cost of supply. That's not what I'm recommending. It by by all means, state can continue its subsidy uh, to whoever it wants to give it to. But the the gap that there's significant time lag between the supply of power and the receipt of subsidies, and that gap needs to disappear. Uh, and um, you know, we have already. Huts, weavers, farmers all got free power. Uh, and like I said, it, there's nothing wrong with identifying specific groups of, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Tamil Nadu's uh, residents and providing them low cost or free power. There's, there's nothing wrong with it, but it needs to be, uh, the payments for that subsidy need to be made promptly. So uh, the first point being integrated energy plan, the second is tariff rationalizing. The third of, as I mentioned earlier was technical capabilities to improve uh, flexibilization of thermal, that becomes an important thing. The state uh, GENCOs uh, and the private uh, uh, thermal operators need to figure out how to get better at ramping up and ramping down coal. Uh, and then finally, sort of leverage and support uh, new RE. And by that, what I mean is particularly the, the, the significant wind capacity that is untapped uh, both offshore and onshore, including the repowering option, as well as uh, the rooftop solar uh, sector, which is uh, urgently in need of an extra push. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here. I'm sorry if I've taken uh, in excess of what was allocated. Uh, and this hand is back to you, Joydeep. And thanks a lot, Bharat. No, you haven't taken any more time than allocated. Uh, it was it was so good that I was extremely reluctant and total and refused to stop you. <laughs> so that's fine. Yes, uh, you were perfectly right, uh, Mr. Mulidharan of Teda was uh, uh, going to be here with us till he was called away this morning because a group of officials from MNRE in Delhi uh, has reached Chennai this morning, so he had to join them at the last moment uh, so th that is what has happened uh, so, uh, anyway i'm sure we'll we can get in touch with mr murli uh, later as and when necessary right so one of the things that came out very strongly from bharat's presentation is the importance of wind power in tamil nadu and that leads us very naturally to our next speaker the Secretary General of the Wind Power Manufacturers Association, Mr. D.V. Giri. Mr. Giri, over to you, sir. Uh, morning, uh, participants and uh, organizers. Thank you very much for this opportunity. 
I'll keep myself very, very brief. So because we have Mr. Uh, Ramani, who is a doyen and a person who can really dwell into the problems of uh, Tamil Nadu. So I will try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, number one, I think you've got to give it to Tamil Nadu that Tamil Nadu has been a pioneer. Without Tamil Nadu, there would be no wind uh, in the country today. And you can also, it's also significant that many of the OEMs, a larger number, have their own factories and downstream units uh, in Tamil Nadu, which I think it's really, really uh, significant. That's point number one. Point number two, when we talk about Tamil Nadu and the kind of... Uh, uh, capacity additions that have happened, I think we need to look at renewable energy and more so wind, because I'm going to speak only about wind, but have nothing to do with solar, I know about solar. As far as wind is concerned, I think it's to be taken as a national resource. It is not to be decided, you know, that Tamil Nadu has met with RPO and therefore what else to do? There is a almost a supply demand uh, a balance coming in and there's nothing much more to do. I think we need to take it as a national resource. And maybe the Tamil Nadu wind sites and the potential, which is somewhere around uh, 67 gigawatts, needs to be uh, pushed out of Tamil Nadu in a number of ways. I'm fully aware that uh, uh, wind is a, sorry, power is a, is a concurrent subject, a lot of challenges, but still, we'll have to overcome this because who has set the, uh, the, 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 the targets for the country? The government of India has set a target of 175 gigawatts, out of which 60 gigawatts goes to, uh, uh, to uh, wind, and out of 450 gigawatts by 2030, 140 gigawatts goes to wind. Which means between now 2020 and 2030, we should be doing about 10, 11 gigawatts per annum. And from 2017, I'm bringing you to a procurement part of it, that in the last three years, we have added something like about 5,000 megawatts, which is about 1.6 gigawatts. So if, if we are going to go this way, either we need to change our targets or we need to relook and do a separate planning altogether as to how we want to move forward. So I would say that as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, primarily it has been a market of captive consumption. The first 20 gigawatts that were built in Tamil Nadu or from A for India, majorly it came from textile, cement, and the other manufacturers. And they were retail investors. Now, post 2017, with state bids at 25 megawatts and central bid at 50 megawatts, this entire retail segment has been thrown away. I think we have now asked the government, not only for Tamil Nadu, but across the country, that we need to have a special dispensation for retail investors below 25 megawatts in whatever form. There are a number of things we have suggested. Either a, a, a tariff to be taken by the, uh, uh, by, the, by the ACRC or introduction of uh, AD as an enabling tool for them to uh, take part. Without which, one or two gigawatts which can be added by the, uh, by the uh, retail segment is completely out. So that's uh, uh, number, number one. Next, when it comes to now I'm sure Tamil Nadu, uh, Tanjitko and Tamil Nadu have their own, uh, uh, their own challenges. Major investment is today coming in group capital. And when it comes to group capital, I'm sure Ramani will go into more details on that, my friend. But I'm told that banking, which was there earlier on a yearly basis, now it's been reduced to a monthly basis there, which means that there'll be more challenges. I think it's, 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 it's no rocket science that you produce in five months, and you spread it over uh, 12 months. I'm sure Tanjitko has some challenges, but I think we have had several uh, deliberations with uh, Tanjitko, and really nothing uh, significant has come out of this particular uh, deliberation. Now, when it comes to repowering, again, out of about four gigawatts or five gigawatts, which are completed 20 years of their uh, life, about 1.4 to 1.5 gigawatts is alone in Tamil Nadu, which means that the 20 years have passed. Unfortunately, these turbines are allowed to uh, generate. I would say that A, you have to look at safety and performance and safety is predominant or more significant than performance. I think after 20 years, irrespective of whether they sell to discount or whether it is uh, for capital consumption, I think 
you have to exit from their PPAs or billing and banking agreements, and then look at natural resource where the best sites are being occupied by really first generation turbines, which have a, a payload of something like about say 12%, 15%, whereas today you have turbines which can give 35% to 40%, whether it is class one or class two machines. So I think on repowering, perhaps I would ask the organizers to have a separate program altogether as to how we can do repowering as a separate subject altogether. Talking about uh, uh, offshore, yes, uh, uh, my previous speaker uh, uh, did mention about the challenges and opportunities. I would say we should look at it as an opportunity because Tamil Nadu, I think, has a potential of something like about 35 gigawatts. And government is today, uh, it's been a long journey where nothing really has happened excepting expression of interest given for uh, one gigawatt. But I would think that perhaps uh, it's more, uh, the progress that has been made is more in, in, in Gujarat. Uh, 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 data collection is going on in, uh, in, in Tamil Nadu. But looking at offshore, I think in terms of looking at the challenges, I think the opportunities are more in terms of employment, uh, ferry services, port development. I think there are significant that things that can happen. Coming to grid, from what I understand from uh, from Nive and from other authorities, both in the CTU and STU, there doesn't seem to be a problem as of now, but I think forward planning is required as far as the grid corridors are concerned. Now, talking about potential of Tamil Nadu and the kind of utilization that's happening, uh, there was a talk about 440 gigawatts or 450 gig, uh, megawatts of uh, tender that was put up out of 500, I think only 50 was done. And believe me, I think it's, uh, it's it's no secret. I really wonder whether this 500 megawatts, 450 megawatts, which is trending, will ever happen. I don't think it's going to happen. So we need to look at beyond RPO and for government of Tamil Nadu or Tangent Code to see as to how this power can be pushed out. Today, under the Seki bits after 2017, what has happened? They want to drive down tariff. It has come down as low as two rupees 45 cents. And all inclusive growth, which was happening in all the seven states before 2017, has now been reduced to just two states and primarily to Gujarat. So everybody ran to Gujarat as if that was the national tariff. Uh, that didn't happen. And Gujarat suddenly decided not to give land. So between 2017 and 2020, I think it's something like about 10, 12,000 uh, megawatts have been bid, out of which about 2,000 megawatts have been uh, commissioned. And many of the developers have even backed out or there is lukewarm response, as Mr. Uh, uh, Bharat said. Now, all this boils down to that you need to have procurement, whether it is on an FIT basis or you will go on a, on a, on a procurement basis of uh, uh, on uh, bidding, you need to have state-wise bidding for tariff collection. And I would also say that it would be wrong to say that government should only look at tariff as just one parameter to say as to what the uh, discounts of the states would have to take. I think power has got no color. You need to blend power. You have set a target. You need to blend power in such a way that the consumer gets the best. In the last three years, whether it's been aided by wind or by solar, has the tariff come down to the consumer even by one naya paisa anywhere? It has not. So let's be very clear that I think we need to set our targets and our opportunities. And if you have signed the uh, Paris COP agreement as to how we are going to go about it, I think that, that I think is the most important thing. So I would say Tamil Nadu has got to look at sales outside. We have asked the government that if you have under the Electricity Act, why can't you allow open access of generation in Tamil Nadu and consumption outside the state? Yes, ISTS waiver is available only up to 2023, I think. Um, and it is only if it is discovered through a competitive bidding. The generators are quite willing to pay ISTS charges on kilowatt hour basis and not on inflate capacity. Why don't you open the door? It can happen. 
capital consumption i think is a birthright i think a person should have should be able to generate and use the power for himself so i would conclude this that tamil nadu is a great playing field it has pioneered without them we would not be having a history of 40 uh, gigawatts as of now but with the targets the government has set unless you redo the plan change your procurement models go beyond the rpo allow interstate transactions to take place and not be tariff ridden i don't think we'll be able to make progress i'll stop with this and i'll hand it over to the organizers thank you very much thank you very much mr giri uh, i am very glad that you brought in the interstate uh, work uh, let's see how that works with the gtam uh, with the new thing let's let's see if that works at all uh, we shall wait and see i want to very quickly move to our next panelist mr n ramani from suzlon energy as all of you know suzlon is one of the biggest players in the wind sector and we are very glad to have mr ramani with us i know that he has to leave very soon for to at, because he is another meeting scheduled so over to you mr ramani yeah uh uh morning everybody i am not sure whether you can uh, see me uh no, but but we can hear you yeah uh since i had come here off the cuff sorry uh, i may not be able to make a very detailed presentation like bharat of course my colleague and friend uh, giri is a veteran and uh, he knows everything like a back to the hand let me try to make something faster see uh, there are some um, positiveness in happening in tamil nadu per se Uh, what has been one of the major problems in tamil nadu payments for sale to board in the recent past there had been a lot of positiveness has happened and payments are getting cleared and uh, there were some compulsions on the generators to make a request that they would like to give a 2% off on the bill that is also being waived off and uh, things are moving very fast to clear which have not been seen in the last 7 uh, 8 years there are some positive movements happening in the payments two again uh, people make better irr and roi if the power is sold to the captive group captive model and recent court ruling confirms our root court has given a ruling in favor of uh court has given a ruling in favor of moving from ppa to group capital thereby i'm forcing a huge interest in tamil nadu for moving from a ppa to captive and group capital and as uh, mr uh, giri said the last one year there were tweaking problems with group captive hopefully people have understood the rules and regulation that's from tneb side as well as from a generator side and a couple of group captive have been cleared thereby we are pretty confident the last one year impasse will be solved and people can go ahead with better uh, is commissioning of turbines also of course one can't make it official but uh, very high likely the banking as mr giri talked about moving from one year to one month with higher probability for the existing commissioned turbines the banking will continue and uh, we hope for the new turbines to be commissioned i am assuming one can follow it up with the officials and get the things done faster uh this is on the positive side and overall if you realize tamil nadu has kept pace with increased in uh, renewables per se and there had been lots of 400 kv substations commissioned which has eased the problem and lesser breakdown per se and with seki projects also coming there had been more 
though it's a national grid and state grid, it does increase the viability and better evacuation of the wind process in Tamil Nadu. And also, yeah, passing reference this year compared to last two, three years, the wind generation been 15 to 18% more. And uh, with cyclones, which is hitting the last 15, 20 days, it is still higher. And normally, the wind season gets over by September. We have seen it's continuing even till today. So thereby, there are uh, more positives of uh, this year. And uh, there are some wind projects coming up, committed with SECI. For example, if I'm not wrong, JSW had already shown some interest for 600 megawatts, and maybe other IPPs like RNG will also be doing some megawatts. Thereby, in Tamil Nadu, whether it's a state grid or a central grid, we will be able to see higher installed capacity by December 2021, hopefully. And uh, as Mr. Giri was talking about, repowering is a very good opportunity for increase the generation, increase the installed capacity, the existing. One of the suggestions will be, see, uh, the vehicles, motor vehicles, they were following a particular pollution norms, Mar Bharat 1, Bharat 2 or something like that. I may not be very familiar with the names, but transport department has also come out with the regulation. If it is a older emission standard, they may not renew the licenses. In the same way, because the vehicles we talk about reducing the pollution, in renewables, in the wind, we can talk about increasing the green power. Beyond the PPA period, central government can come with the regulation or a suggestion or a guidelines to state government to discontinue the HTSC number or the evacuation uh, process. See, what happens is, as Mr. Giri talked about, there are turbines which is running beyond 25, 28 years also. So from to increase the potential of the optimum utilization of the grid and the site, it is a high time the tangent co disconnects, stops the PPA, also disconnect the HTSC number whereby people cannot wheel the power generated. There will be a natural compulsion on the existing investors to start looking around how to use the prime sites. As on date, imagine I have a turbine installed 25 years ago, still running. I'm happy with that. Whatever the return I'm getting, there is no need for me to sell because uh, whatever I'm getting is a bonus for me. And there is no regulations to stop or wheel the generation. So if there is a regulation coming from a tangent co government of Tamil Nadu, government of India together, because it's a concurrent subject. One, if there is, a, if my prime site, if I can't generate to wheel, then I will be compelled to look around what I should do. So with my neighbors, or if I'm having already existing wind farms, I should be able to, uh, look for a re repowering. Also, repowering today, the policy of a cell government is not very conducive for investment. One has to be more investor friendly, especially with reference to repowering, so that it helps the repowering taking to your next step. And also, with the latest uh, SECI project, uh, SECI tender of solar wind hybrid as well as thermal also included i am sure there are uh, willingness of various investors to include the existing uh, thermal plants in tamil nadu and um, because of the competitiveness in tamil nadu there are uh, many thermal plants uh, which are not in a very uh, good health so what can happen is uh, they are already participating in the second bit for that. So that will increase the wind potential in Tamil Nadu also. Also, as Mr. Giri talked about, yes, uh, 
Tamil Nadu is already having lots of uh, crisp crossing of the 400 kV substations and uh, PGCL had already started working near completion maybe in a near future maybe in a, within a year you can come across 765 kV corridor getting uh, completed with 765 kV corridor getting completed uh, as Mr. Giri was talking about the potential of Tamil Nadu can be better explored exploited getting connected with the highest wind potential or a highest install capacity in Tamil Nadu with this 765 kV grid coming up, I am sure uh, the power generator in Tamil Nadu, if it is able to get wheeled to outside Tamil Nadu, and which will in turn increase the furthering of uh, wind capacity in Tamil Nadu will happen. With this, this is what I could make off the cuff. If there is any questions, uh, maybe people can send it, I can answer it. Thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ramani. Uh, yes, um, I know. Uh, you have to leave for another meeting, sir. Uh, so here's a message to all participants. If you still, uh, if you have any other questions for Mr. Ramani that you want answered, please let us know. We'll we'll share his email and you can send him send him the question. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine. There is actually one question uh, right now uh, that is uh, there already. Yeah. Uh, from Priyanka Shankar, which you may want to talk about it, uh, or Mr. Giri want to talk about it. You, the, I'm just reading out the question. It says, uh, what are the potential areas or districts where wind power can be expanded? What's the reaction of the locals there with respect to aesthetic displeasure or any other reason? Uh, maybe let me answer so that subsequently Mr. Giri can further add it. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, See, uh, without repowering, Tamil Nadu installations are getting expanded beyond the core area. When I'm saying core area, where the speed was higher, more respectable, now we are going to a lesser wind compared to the prime areas. And now we started moving towards Taini, Trichy, Madurai. I'm using the directions rather than the districts. There may be something like a Karur districts and things like that, which all the people may not be aware. I'm saying this is moving towards Pulivalam in Trichy and uh, some place in uh, Karur uh, near Coimbatore and things like that. So thereby, uh, with the higher, for example, there are three megawatt turbines coming and the higher 130 mega, uh, 30 meters of a blade coming and 120 meter of a height coming. And even the lesser windy sites still the economy of our uh, investments takes place and uh, we are sure uh, still the capacity of a uh, potential of tamil nadu will increase further to 65 to 90 gigawatts of which maybe a uh, 20 megawatts would have been explored still another 70 gigawatt is possible and uh, another one also with uh, solar coming since the topic is renewables in tamil nadu Solar coming and uh, lots of distribution substations are also getting attracted and uh, renewable generation is getting distributed. And uh, solar does play a vital role of local generation getting consumed locally. So which will not have an impact on uh, state grid per se. That will also lead to a better stability and lesser uh, losses and things like that. Yeah, over to Giri and uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Before I uh, ask Mr. Giri to respond to this, there is another question that's specifically for you. I'm not very sure I understand this question. Is it, it says, to what extent will Cyclone add power to the TN grid this year? Any estimate? I wouldn't have thought that Cyclones could add any power because they're too uncertain. But the question yeah, is addressed uh, to you. Sir. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, see, the very reason the Cyclone means it does come accompany the wind. Normally in this time, the wind is need not be high, whereas this year the wind, uh, wind is high due to the cyclone also. During the cyclone time, it need not, the effect of a pre-cyclone and post-cyclone, it does have an impact. And I may not be able to talk in terms of quantum, but it does, uh, for example, the two cyclones just already uh, hit uh, Tamil Nadu. I'm sure it has increased the, or extended the wind season by another 10 to 15 days. So that to uh, imagine uh, September is getting extra up to November end and December, uh, almost a 15 days. I'm sure that I'm glad a considerable unexpected bonanza. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Giri, would you like to respond to that other question about uh, which are the good um, uh, districts? I, 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 I think Mr. Yeah. Ramani, has, uh, Ramani, Mr. Ramani has said it all. Uh, there is a, a wind atlas that is made by uh, Nive, both at 100 meters and at 120 meters. At 100, 100 meters, it is 302 gigawatts, and all, I'm talking about all India, and as far as 120 meters, it's about 695 uh, gigawatts. This wind, wind atlas is available in Nive, where they will be able to give the coordinates where it can happen. And Mr. Uh, uh, Ramani has elaborated where our uh, turbines are now able to come up. I think the important thing is, though we are moving away from the prime wind sites, the technology of uh, wind turbines has moved up so much. You know, people say it is simply that you have increased the hub height and you have increased the blade length and therefore it is generating more. No. The technology of uh, static stability of a turbine working at 130 meters, it's dynamic. So I think it's a very, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually an engineering marvel. So to come back to your question, I think even if you are moving away from prime wind sites, we have good technology turbines which can give a PLF of a good percentage of 30 plus and give a meaningful IRR, provided, of course, the tariff is comfortable, which is not now. And as far as uh, Cyclone is concerned, uh, Mr. Ramani said it very well, but what we really require is placid winds with good talk and without much of a turbulence. And the turbine itself is designed in such a way that if the wind velocity goes beyond 25 meters per second, the computer will naturally switch off the turbine. So the safety of the turbine is uh, taken care of. So cyclone might help to extend the wind season, but cyclone is not preferred by uh, for wind energy. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Giri. Right, we come to the last panelist of our media workshop, and she is one of our colleagues. And that is why she is coming last, because from all you have heard, she is the one who can point you to some excellent story ideas. And after which, after she has spoken, I will tell you about more opportunities for story grants. So I request Vandana Gombar, ed the editor of Bloomberg NEF, er, to take the floor now. Um, thank you, Joydeep. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes. Okay, hear clearly. wonderful. Yes. So um, I'm just looking at the time. I'm going to keep it really, really short. Uh, five points to make, and um, I'll just kick off right away. The first thing I wanted to say was um, writing about um, climate, energy, sustainability, it's a, it's a very new world. It's, um, it's a world where definitions are still evolving. It's a world where standards are still being set. And a lot of that um, are essentially stories that are worth writing about. Um, so as you know, we had, we had a similar seminar earlier. So my, my speech is rather rehearsed. I'm going to repeat the same points. Essentially, you have all these um, let's say net zero announcements, um, net zero announcements that have come in. You've got it from China, you've got it from Japan, you've got it from Korea, you've got companies that are saying we want to be uh, carbon neutral or climate neutral. What is carbon neutral? What is the difference between carbon neutrality and climate neutrality? Carbon is only looking at carbon emissions. Climate neutral is you're looking at all greenhouse gas as all greenhouse gases, including nitrous uh, oxide and methane and everything else. So these are stories um, that these are sto interesting stories to tell. I mean, what I've seen is that the difference between climate neutrality and carbon neutrality, even to practitioners in the sector, they are still figuring it out. Uh, many, many terms, um, uh, you know, so for instance, green bond standards evolved. So standards of what is climate neutral standards on on what is um, sustainable, what is actually sustainable, what is greenwashing, these are still evolving. And I think they give interesting opportunities to writers. 
The second point I wanted to make is that uh, whatever we are writing about, it, it makes sense to relate it to your reader. So if you are talking about um, uh, global warming or if you're talking about sea level rise, then it makes sense to, um, to essentially relate it to a person, a resident in your state. So what does that mean for property prices? What does that mean for power prices? What does that mean for your health? What does that mean for the price of your food? Um, these linkages are best drawn by writers in this sector. And, and that makes the whole subject and um, uh, that makes the whole subject more personal and, and more interesting to read uh, rather than just a standalone um, by what estimate uh, the sea level could possibly rise because of global warming. Uh, the third thing that I want to say is um, uh, local stories. So many, many stories are are just very specific to the state that you're in, and and you have a chance to uh, essentially. Um, is speak to a global audience because you're best place to speak to that global audience. You're, you're sitting in that state, uh, you know the dynamics of that state, you know you know the state of play. Um, and so there are, you know, for instance, the, the, the whole story that we've heard about wind, the whole debate on RE powering, uh, the residents' reaction to expansion of energy. Um, I also think that as writers, um, it's our job to kind of um, uh, kind of encourage a debate on the energy choices that we are making in the state and in the country. Uh, I think that earlier um, the the decisions were made at at kind of um, at a level which did not involve the local population. Um, you know the the term NIMBY, not in my backyard. Nobody wants a nuclear plant in the backyard. Perhaps nobody wants a coal plant. Uh, I just think that part of our job as writers is also to encourage thought and encourage debate on what are the choices we should make. So that means the local public should be involved uh, in what they prefer. Um, actually, I personally would like a choice uh, in, in terms of the kind of power that I'm consuming. Um, uh, perhaps I'd like to consume more green power. Uh, perhaps I'm willing to pay a premium to consume green power. And uh, the way things are right now, um, the prices of um, renewable energy uh, that we are looking at, well, you can get green power and you can get cheap power. So um, it's it's a very win-win combination. Um, we heard, uh, I think it was Dr. Giri who mentioned that um, none of the the headline prices that we see for renewable energy have been reflected in our power bills. So perhaps we need a wider debate on why that is not happening. Some a lot of things that need to be ironed out along the way. Uh, I've already spoken about the energy choices debate. My last point is on, on technology. Do keep an eye out for new technologies and, and new new developments in existing technologies. So what are the, what are the I don't know, the next... Um, um, Tech, the next um, generation of turbines. Uh, you know, you. Uh, I think it was just last month that we had the the biggest um, offshore wind um, project uh, achieving financial closure, and they're going to be using 15 megawatt turbines. That's really huge. 15 megawatts for a single turbine. So, uh, how is technology evolving? Um, what are the new technologies? So, you know, there are. There are these pre-pilot projects for uh, generating power from waves or generating power from tides. And, and it's a good idea to just keep a lookout on what's happening, uh, even in terms of solar, in terms of building integrated PV, or, or whether we're looking at how agriculture can be merged with solar or floating solar or solar on um, canal tops. So um, Last point, um, I, I'm an editor with uh, Bloomberg NEF, and uh, I would obviously recommend um, keeping a track of what is posted on the blog there, which is outside the paywall, but, uh, you know, just keeping track of what Central Electricity Authority is saying, what the International um, Energy Agency is saying, some of these primary sources of information, UNFCCC, climate change, global warming, a good idea to um, to track what 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 the themes are and how they are evolving. 
uh, that's my very short piece. And in the interest of time, um, I've just um, contracted it. And um, so that we can have more time for questions. Back to you, Joydeep. Thank, thank you, Vandana. I think that was very useful. It should give some story ideas to people. I'm, I'm going to follow that up by telling all our colleagues about a story grant opportunity that's out. It's been out uh, for some time. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen uh, so that you know what I'm talking about. Right, so th this is a story grant opportunity that's out. I'll put the link in the chat box. And remember that these are story grants are available on renewable energy in Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. And we are looking for good applications. You have to make your own budget to do it. You have to send in our uh, send in your applications to us by 15th of December. Please don't miss the deadline because the software won't let you submit after that. Remember, you have to prepare your own budget depending on how what you're going to spend, etc. But keep the here's a suggestion: keep the budget at around ninety thousand rupees per story. Okay, so. Uh, we shall be awaiting your story grant applications. Good. Now I'm going to go back to the questions. And I can see one question in the answer in the Q&A box from Priyanka Shankar. And Mr. Giri, this is again related to wind power. So uh, it's for you. It says, we have individuals putting up solar panels to power their own homes. How far are we from setting up mini wind energy generators in at home? Or is this just a sci-fi imagination? Well, we don't call them uh, wind turbines or wind generators. We call them as aero generators. And a lot of aero generators were imported from uh, China. And I'm sorry to say that the quality was not so good. And there were also issues in uh, net metering and uh, it did not really uh, take off. So if you really ask me whether this will succeed uh, like solar rooftop, uh, I'm afraid it's not. I would say that wind is uh, grid connected. And though I, 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 I'm nobody to talk about uh, solar, but from what I've heard outside uh, the outer world or outside India, success stories are on uh, rooftop solar, uh, which will help as uh, Vandana talked about, involving the community, the people to generate power. I think that's what is really required. And I would also say this, uh, not against solar again, that solar uh, consumes a lot of land. It requires almost about five acres per megawatt, whereas wind is on a footprint basis. When you put a wind turbine, the surrounding area, agriculture can actually exist, which one has seen in Denmark or in Spain or any of these countries. So uh, to the pointed question, I'm not so sure whether uh, aero generators on uh, rooftops is the answer. I don't think it's going to work. Right, thank you. Right, uh, well, we were supposed to have this media workshop, online media workshop for an hour. I see that we have gone 20 minutes beyond that, which is, Perfectly fine, as uh, because I can see that there is a lot of interest. Uh, but yeah, in the interest of time, I think the best thing to do is to bring this to an end right now. Please remember, we are going to share the recording with you. We are going to share Bharat's and Sapna's presentations with you. And if you have any questions, please come back to us. Thank you very much. Have a good day, all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.